Cool. Um, I don't know why. Uh, cool. We are allowing people to arrive. Just give it a few more minutes. I hope everyone is well. We will start the event soon. Hi, Sandra. Just give us. Um, the it appears the chat oh, yeah we will enable the chat for people to um to ask questions in the chat, I believe. all right if you have questions please share them in the q a um we did not enable the chat for this Hello, everyone. Give us one more moment. Hopefully, we can arrive soon. We were experiencing a technical difficulty, so we will start. So I'm going to begin introducing uh, the panel, and hopefully we we can um, we can elevate the um, uh, additional speaker when they arrive. Uh, hopefully we, yep. Um, so hi, welcome. Uh, uh, this is the Wiki for Human Rights uh, 2023 launch webinar. Uh, as happens uh, each year with the campaign. Um, uh, uh, and we are, uh, sorry, we're experiencing a panelist difficulty. Give me one moment. Um, uh, the Um, so hi, welcome to the launch event. This is an opportunity for us to discuss the the uh, Wiki for Human Rights campaign and the themes and topics important to the campaign. Uh, this launch webinar is hosted as a partnership between the Wikimedia Foundation and UN Human Rights. Uh, we are excited to have you here as part of the collaboration. And we're going to do a brief introduction before we get to our panel. And hopefully our uh, other panelists can arrive um, uh, in that process. So uh, we're, we're so excited to have you. Um, the what is the Wiki for Human Rights campaign? What is the right to a healthy environment? It's often very important to have this context. Um, it's often very important to have this context as we go into running a campaign. And so this is the introduction. Um, we've been running this campaign for about four years now, uh, first with a focus on uh, uh, the general uh, get knowledge gaps about uh, human rights and, and Wikimedia projects. Uh, and it's all based on this one idea that we all have an opportunity to act for the right uh, for our rights by sharing knowledge about the environmental crisis and connecting it to human rights. Um, this is a partnership as part of UN uh, Human Rights and the Wikimedia Foundation, and we've been supported by UN Environmental Program. Uh, which uh, allows us to uh, prioritize and document um, uh, the various knowledge gaps around the connection between human rights and the environment. Um, this isn't just about 
the legal process of human rights or simply the knowledge gaps about specific environmental crises, right? It's not just about the climate crisis, pollution crisis, biodiversity crisis, but rather it's about how do we prepare for future generations? How do we make sure all humans can live in dignity and uh, in relation to the environment in a healthy, sustainable way? Um, it's really important because we live in a context and in a world where many environmental crises, many elements of environmental degradation are, are around us uh, every day. It's, it's happening everywhere, it's affecting us all, and it's affecting our human rights um, in the process. And the, the unintended consequences of our choices, of the various things we do as, as society, both as industry, and as individuals, as, as governments, and as communities, affects our right to a healthy environment and also our other um, human rights. And so telling the story, making this connection in public knowledge through platforms like Wikimedia and Wikipedia projects are absolutely critical. And so our focus this year on the launch webinar and the conversation we're having is on documenting the impacts of pollution uh, as one of those main environmental crises. And to explain a bit more on why the pollution is in focus this year and to connect it to the right to a healthy environment, I wanna invite uh, Juliana Almiada, uh, Almiida, um, to uh, discuss uh, this focus. Over to you, Juliana. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you so much, and you, the Wikimedia Foundation as well for organizing these these campaign uh, and uh, these launch event, which is uh, so important to to ensure that we bring light to human rights and the connection between human rights and the environment. Um, and so, as you, as you've been saying, of course, the idea, the goal is to in, include and recognize these human rights-based approaches in how we deal with the triple planetary crisis uh, of climate change, of biodiversity and nature loss, and of pollution, which of course is the 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 focus of this this year campaign. And so, this connection between human rights and uh, and um, and um, the environment has been increasing. And it, it actually culminated, as you've been saying, with this recognition of this human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment by the General Assembly last year. So the General Assembly is the main policy making organ of the UN. And this also follows a recognition done by, uh, in 2021 uh, by the Human Rights Council. So this is the main body in the UN that addresses human rights and human rights violations. So it has been, uh, the past two years have been important, very important in, in this context. And why is this right important? It, it's important because it means that pe pe all people have a tool to hold governments, old big polluters and others into account of their um, environment, the environment arms that they cause uh, around the world. And so in these, without going to a lot of detail on the right to a healthy environment, but there is one uh, element that uh, deserves special attention and that is the access to information, uh, which is exactly what this campaign is promoting and uh, ensuring and disseminating. And so the, pub the public access to environmental information actually enables individuals to understand how any environmental arm may arm any environmental arm may undermine, undermine their own rights, including the right to life, the right to health, mm -hmm. and also these right, access to information and its right uh, supports the exercise of other rights. Uh, the right to expression, the right to association, the right to participation, to have remedies, and so on. There's a lot a, uh, uh, already legally binding instruments that ensure this uh, and more under, the, under discussion uh, so it's already a um, consolidate, consolidated element also uh, at the international level. But now just going, you can move the, the slide, Alex, to the next one. So we can just um, talk a bit on what, what is being done to actually address pollution at the international level address pollution and toxics and it's 
the UN and the international community have been doing a lot uh, on this. Uh, but pollution, of course, is not by any means a new phenomenon. It's actually even more extensive, pervasive, and persistent. It affects our health through the food we eat, the water we drink, the air we breathe. And even a report that came out last year um, from the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment identified pollution and toxic substances as the cause of at least 9 million premature deaths. So there's a lot of work to, to be done. And uh, I'll just go through some, some elements. You, here in the photos, you can see actually the, the agreement to start negotiations on a new plastics treaty uh, that is meant to be finalized by the end of 2024. And uh, it's the unparalleled recognition that uh, from the international community that we need to deal with the, the plastics pandemic that we have right now. We, let's think about the plastic island in the Pacific, the block rivers in Guatemala, the microplastics we have in our blood. So it's really a pandemic that we need also to address. Another uh, um, ongoing uh, uh, initiative that I want to address is also uh, the establishment of a science policy panel to contribute for further to the sound management of chemicals and waste with the goal to prevent pollution. So this is um, under the assumption that all our work, policy work needs to be based on scientific evidence, which I think we will address these also during the launch. And, um, and so we have already panels like this one that wants to that is being created for climate change and biodiversity. And now the goal is to have the same for pollution. Um, two more elements and then I finish, but just to say that there is also under discussion um, the, an update to the current policy framework to promote chemical safety around the world. It's a big name called the strategic approach to international chemicals manage, management, but the idea is really to minimize the health and environmental impact of chemicals throughout their life cycle to ensure better protection of our health and the health of our planet. Finally, just to, to highlight that this year's World Environment Day on 5th of June will be focused on uh, um, beating plastic pollution. Uh, it will be hosted by Cote d'Ivoire and the idea is really to uh, call into further action and attention the challenges we are facing and of course, gather momentum and call call for more action. Um, thank you. I hope I wasn't too long and that I provided a good overview of, of what's happening. And uh, I wish everyone a good uh, a good event and a good panel discussion. Thank you so much, Juliana. It's wonderful to have partnership from UNEP and UN Human Rights to to pursue and document the knowledge. And it's so important for topics like climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss. And I'm really excited we can talk about that theme just now. Um, before we get into the panel, we wanted to put a little bit of context. Why is the Wikimedia movement, why is this community that uh, forms, that edits Wikipedia and contributes to Wikipedia organizing to document this knowledge? What does that look like? We're gonna show a video briefly uh, that uh, gives voice to some of our contributors in the Wikimedia movement. And then I'm gonna invite Euphemia Yuandu, who's our organizing fellow for this year, to talk about how that works. So hopefully the audio for the video. And can I get a thumbs up if the sound is working? No. Just a second. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So the, the sound was not working on the... No. Okay. Uh, just a second. Share sound. Mm, let me try it again. Yep, yes, it. cool. 
it's an exciting place to be, where you get to understand that you're not alone in the in the fights uh, against this uh, little knowledge of Wikipedia relating to the Af uh, African and uh, romantic literature. It was a nice training and a lot of experience. Like I learned how to do my own things, like creating an article, editing an article. That was so fun. que es muy crucial es que la crisis ambiental actual eh, tiene un efecto muy fuerte sobre la biodiversidad. La biodiversidad constituye toda la, la, la variedad de especies, plantas, animales, otras cosas que no, que no se ven en nuestros ecosistemas eh, y que es necesario conocerlas eh, para poder protegerlas. Por lo tanto, eh, editar en Wikipedia eh, sumando a, esos, a, esas, a esa biodiversidad permite que todos este, las conozcamos más eh, y podamos apreciarlas y cuidarlas. So that was just a brief preview of all the different community activities that we had uh, last year. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Fimi, to talk about how communities are organizing this year. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Euphemia Owando, the 2023 Senior Content Campaign Organizing Fellow at the Wikimedia Foundation. I'm also a youth activist working with the UNFCCC Youth Constituency, Yongo, a global network of youth voices that brings their experiences to the solution of the climate crisis. As you saw in the video, our organizing fellow for the Wiki for Human Rights in 2022, Ruby Damenshi Brown, was able to work with communities around the world to fill key knowledge gaps related to their contest. And this year, I've had the opportunity to encourage Wikimedia communities to grow the campaign. Next slide. So as a young person and a woman from the global south, I have the greater understanding of the need to advocate for diversity and inclusion in building knowledge about how uh, the world is facing and adapting to climate change because we are only able to understand how different or similar we are in the way climate change affects us when we have different people from diverse uh, backgrounds share their experiences um, around the subject and this is the unique space that the wiki for human rights campaign creates one that allows people from Africa, from the Maghreb, Middle East, Latin America, Lusophone countries, and Central and Eastern Europe to share their climate and environmental uh, stories. But what is even more remarkable about sharing this knowledge is the ability to share it in a language that even a local farmer would understand if he experiences low crop yield as a result of drought or even affected by flooding. Because how can we even explain to him that those are the indirect effects of climate change if we do not explain to him in a language that he understands? And this is the most exciting uh, part of the campaign because it empowers people and communities to express climate change and environmental issues in diverse languages and formats, ranging from written, visual, and audio recordings, while learning from each other. And this is what makes it so powerful. To the Wikimedia communities, it empowers them to discuss the environmental issues in their own context giving voice to the very problems that they are facing in, in the communities. 
And when we look at the human and environmental communities, for example, we also see this as a great opportunity for them to share in communicating in public platforms about how these crises are affecting them directly. And this is why I'm really so joyful uh, accompanying Wikimedia communities to ensure that every voice and every uh, story is brought to the table. Thank you. And back to you, Alex. And I, I have to say, Euphemia has been doing a wonderful job connecting our communities to the skills and opportunities they need uh, to run these events this year. And a lot of credit goes to her for just creating the best space we possibly can for communities around the world to participate. Um, at the end of the panel, I will share a bit on how we can get involved. Uh, but for now, I want to turn to the actual panel itself um, and introduce you to our wonderful guest panelists. Uh, as I, I'm going to do a brief introduction to each of you, and then I, I, I'll ask you to introduce yourself as well um, in your own voice, kind of describing how did you get involved in the climate crisis or and addressing the pollution, which is the theme of our, our panel, um, and and what what do you do? So first, I want to introduce Monica Stens. Uh, Kiewicz, uh, who is the um, uh, general, um, sorry, I'm getting your title wrong, Executive Secretary of the Minamata Convention on Mercury. Uh, uh, hi, Monica. How did you get involved in this space? Thank you so much, Alex, and good day, everyone. Um... I hope you can hear me well. I'm actually traveling and I do not have a full control on the, uh, on the environment around me. So my light is really bad. I apologize for that. Nevertheless, I'm, I'm really happy to, to join you and thank you for, for organizing the webinar and again, for having me uh, at the webinar. Uh, perhaps I would like to say that uh, my, my first job was in the uh, public administration in Poland, uh, where I dealt with the protection of the marine environment of the Baltic Sea. Uh, the Baltic Sea is, the, is a small uh, semi-enclosed sea in the north of Europe, and uh, often it is or was referred to as the most polluted sea in the world. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's true any longer, but uh, through that work, I got to know where the pollution comes from, uh, how it impacts the marine environment. Uh, I also uh, had the possibility to witness how through international collaboration, concrete measures to prevent pollution or reduce pollution uh, were taken by the countries bordering the Baltic Sea. Uh, and one uh, takeaway message for me from that uh, period of my life uh, was that it is so much uh, less expensive to prevent pollution than to uh, uh, clean it up afterwards. Uh, and in the Baltic Sea, uh, the so-called legacy pollution, pollution that has accumulated over the decades, is a major concern. And one such legacy pollution is mercury. Uh, now I'm working in the Secretariat of the Minamata Convention on Mercury and I have a chance to work to prevent a similar contamination with mercury in other parts of the world. So this is perhaps a short uh, introduction how I got to work with the, with the topic of pollution and how I have been doing it actually through my entire career. Thank you. Over to you, Alex. Thank you, Monica. It's it's so great to have you here on the panel and such a wealth of experience. Um, I, next, I want to introduce uh, uh, Joe Banner, who is the co-founder and co-director of the Descendants Project, a, a group working with um, uh, communities in the south of the United States to advocate for their uh, uh, their own protection of the environment and rights. So, Joe, uh, how did you get involved in protect pollution? Hello, everyone. And I, uh, I feel Monica's pain because I'm also traveling um, internationally and and I was I was so con concerned that I would get the time zone messed up. So I'm happy I am here and thank everyone for being here and also that I was invited to be a part of the panel. Uh, I'm from Louisiana, from an area 
known, um, it's my home, but it's also known as Cant's Rally. Uh, that's because my area is inundated with facilities or polluters that produce a lot of dangerous chemicals in, in our air, water, and land. And my community is suffering with that. They're suffering from the impacts of this pollution through high cancer rates, asthma rates that are through the roof, and um, different ailments. So as I saw this happening in my community, um, I wanted to speak out and do the best that I could to alleviate the problem and also prevent any more introduction of uh, polluters. Unfortunately, I have a government that is um, that cooperates with polluters in the name of economy, a false economy, in my opinion, and from what our, our information shows. So uh, we're constantly having to fight back against the introduction of more pollution to our area, despite the fact that numerous research has shown our community is suffering. Um, peer reviewed studies, many really respected information that says that our community has is at its limit. Um, we're, we're drowning and everyone keeps handing us water um, in order to save us. So we, we need another way, we need another path forward. What we have done is um, we've organized our community. We shared as much as we could, as we can about the permitting process. Uh, oftentimes communities don't know that there are steps for these organizations or these, uh, these companies that come in in order for them to achieve the permits they need to operate. So what we do is we inform our community as much as possible when those permit opportunities exist. And also um, we let them know about what's happening in our air and our atmosphere, what these chemicals do to us um, and how they are dangerous and what it means to, to suffer from this. Um, right now we are, we're fighting, for example, our latest, the project, proposed project is a grain terminal um, by Greenfield, Louisiana that wants to locate into our community. Grain terminals produce a lot of pollution. In addition to that, the size of the pollution which is PM 2.5, is small enough to enter into our lungs and cause a lot of issues within our body. But those small um, microns also allow other um, dangerous chemicals to attach to it, like um, ethylene oxide or benzene. They can all attach to these molecules and then enter into our, our lungs. I heard an analogy recently that it's like a suitcase. And that's what grain dust will do uh, uh the about 85 tons coming from this facility should it happen so um just breaking it down to our community and saying we have to stop this because we already we are already at capacity um we cannot allow any more of these um industries to enter into our communities they destroy communities they break up even our 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 livelihood and our happiness and just our human rights to our heritage uh will be eliminated by this um so we advocate by, by educating our community. Also, I go wherever I can to spread the news about what's happening in Cancer Rally in Louisiana. I've gone to Geneva, going to Uruguay, I go to DC. I try to go into my local government um, in St. John and Baptist Parish, but unfortunately we are given the space to even advocate on a very local level because our government has been so captured by corporations and polluters. So we have to go all over, I mean, I'm in Mexico City right now, um, but wherever we can spread the message and 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 encourage an intervention, that's why that's where me and my my sister Joy, who's also with me, that's where we go in order to to do whatever we can to get assistance. That's such a powerful kind of step into activism to have to spread the word to share the knowledge everywhere you can. Uh, that's that's just like a, such a powerful origin story or, or need uh, that your community has. Um, I also want to introduce Soledad, uh, who also works uh, actively with local communities. Uh, Soledad is the vice president of the Asociación Nacional Recicladores de Chile, which is a community of both formal and informal uh, 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 recyclers and waste gatherers in Chile. Hola, Soledad. Uh, uh, Welcome, and uh, can you introduce yourself? Hola, muchas gracias. Bueno, ya me presentó Alex. Eh, soy de Chile. Soy recicladora de base. Eh, en Wikimedia eh, está escrito qué es lo que es un reciclador. 
se dice ahí en Wikimedia que un reciclador es una persona que recolecta, separa y recicla residuos de todo tipo, desde los plásticos, metales, eh, cartones, celulosas en general. Y, y fue una eh, importante definición que Wikimedia pudo eh, presentar en sus páginas, en su plataforma, porque de alguna forma u otra se visibiliza a un actor invisible. Yo soy recicladora de base hace 17 años, pertenezco a la Asociación de Recicladores en Chile, soy presidenta, soy parte de la red latinoamericana del Caribe y de recicladores de base, donde estamos 17 países, pertenezco a la Alianza Internacional de Recicladores del de Mundo, donde existen hoy día 38 países de todos los continentes del mundo, eh, que hemos eh, de alguna forma u otra, eh, inconscientemente, y hoy día más consciente que nunca, eh, eh, hacernos cargo de algo que nadie en, en su principio se hizo cargo, que tiene que ver con este tema que hoy día nos tiene a todos acá reunidos, que tiene que ver con la contaminación y el cambio climático en nuestro mundo. Eh, los recicladores de base hemos recolectado por muchos años miles y miles de toneladas en mi país, Chile, somos hasta cuarta generación de recicladores de base. Existen hasta sexta generación de recicladores en otros países que no hemos hecho cargo de estos residuos de una forma, como les digo, inconsciente, por una necesidad económica. Los recicladores de base somos consecuencia de modelos económicos de nuestros países, donde lamentablemente nuestros derechos humanos, nuestros derechos básicos son totalmente vulnerados. Eh, en una cosa tan básica y tan primordial como es la subsistencia y la sobrevivencia para poder vivir de forma digna en nuestros países. Lamentablemente eso no existe y nos obligó a salir a la calle a mirar las bolsas de basuras o los tachos de basura que muchos de ustedes sacan a la calle para que pase el camión y se los lleve. Desde ahí nosotros miramos un material valioso, un residuo. Y también somos parte de un grupo humano muy importante que participa y que trabaja directamente en los vertederos a cielo abierto, donde nuestros compañeros tratan de recolectar y sacar la mayor cantidad de materiales de esos lugares. Cuando se pregunta cuál es nuestra forma de apoyar o ayudar este proceso, esta importancia de este cambio tan importante de paradigma entre nosotros los seres humanos, frente a un escenario tan complejo como es el cambio climático, podemos decir que nosotros los recicladores de base los pepenadores, los catadores, los recolectores, los cartoneros, como se nos llama en distintos lugares, nos hemos hecho cargo de esto hace mucho rato. No hay forma de cuantificar la labor de un reciclador que lleva 60 años recolectando residuos, evitando que miles y cientos de toneladas terminen en el río, en el mar, o incluso enterrados en los vertederos. Nos hemos hecho cargo de esto eh, de forma eh, muy necesaria, para nuestra vida económica, sustentando nuestros hogares, pero hoy sabemos también la importancia de lo que hemos hecho durante tanto tiempo. En, en Nairobi, Kenia, 5.2, logramos posesionar a los recicladores de base como un eslabón primordial, si no el primero, de la recolección de residuos y de este impacto tan importante que es eh, el, la contaminación por plástico. Lamentablemente, en nuestra vida diaria, de la recolección que hacemos, nos vemos también afectados directamente por la contaminación por plástico. La generación que se produce a través de los gases de efecto invernadero que se generan en los vertederos e incluso en las mismas bolsas de basura que ustedes sacan a la calle, eh, impactan en la salud nuestra. Sabemos que los plásticos hoy día tienen una gran contaminación de químicos que generan cáncer y enfermedades renales importantes incluso a nuestra piel. Por eso es tan importante entender cuál es la labor de estos hombres y mujeres, que no somos pocos, somos más de 20 millones de recicladores en el mundo. Hoy día estamos tratando de incidir en la UNEA, en este tratado tan importante que es el tratado de plástico, pero no solamente desde la mirada económica y la vulneración de nuestros derechos, sino que la vulneración de derechos humanos de nuestro sistema, de nuestro ecosistema, del medio ambiente cómo se han vulnerado los derechos no solamente de seres humanos, sino que también de las grandes especies que existen en este planeta, llevándola al exterminio. Hoy tenemos una importante labor, pero esa labor es importante siempre y cuando se reconozca 
quiénes son los protagonistas y los pioneros de este proceso, que sin querer nos hemos hecho cargo de algo que nadie se quiso hacer cargo, y que sin querer hoy día tenemos una labor tan importante que es la recolección. Pueden hacerse cientos de miles de campañas de recolección, pueden hacerse, hacerse cientos mil campañas de, de conciencia y de, de humanizar al ser humano dentro de estos procesos, pero si no hay una conciencia clara de quiénes son y cómo debemos hacernos cargo realmente de los residuos, van a seguir siendo campañas comunicacionales. En nuestra visión nosotros creemos que existen varios actores importantes dentro de eso. Por un lado la producción de plástico, que son los grandes productores de las petroquímicas y también los productores de envase y embalaje de plástico. Por otro lado, los responsables también somos nosotros, los consumidores, que de alguna forma u otra no hemos querido hacernos cargo de esta sobreproducción de plástico. También está la responsabilidad importante, como lo han mencionado muchos de los que ya han hablado, del Estado. Cómo el Estado de alguna forma u otra se hace cargo y es responsable de parar la sobreproducción de plástico y ponerle un alto a esto de una vez por todas. Y por último, y no menos importante, estamos nosotros los recolectores, los recicladores, los waste pickers, que de alguna forma u otra no estamos haciendo cargo de esto, pero no podemos hacernos cargo solo de esto. Necesitamos que se, va, se valide, se visibilice un proceso tan importante como es la recolección. Podemos parar la producción de plástico, pero todavía existen por lo menos 20 años para poder recuperar lo que hoy día está en el mercado, lo que hoy día está en las calles, lo que hoy día está en los ríos, lo que hoy día está en el océano. Hay una isla de plástico que podemos demorarnos hasta 20, 30 años en poder limpiar nuestros mares. Y la única forma de hacerlo es realmente unificar fuerzas y hacernos cargo de una forma concreta y real. El tratado de plástico es solamente un tratado y se pueden aplicar muchas leyes dentro del tratado. Pero si nosotros no tomamos conciencia y no tomamos un protagonismo real y concreto frente a la recolección de residuos, lamentablemente, va a ser un tratado más. Hemos visto muchos tratados y hemos visto también muchos escenarios de procesos, de campañas importantes de recolección de residuos, sobre todo de plástico, pero que terminan solamente en eso, en una hermosa y linda campaña. Y esto no tiene continuismo. Los recicladores de base sí tenemos continuismo. Nosotros estamos ahí, estamos en la calle, estamos dentro de los vertederos y rellenos sanitarios. Estamos en todos los lugares y creemos que es importante que la labor nuestra sea visibilizada. Una campaña de reciclaje o de recolección o de conciencia ambiental tiene que ir de la mano con los grandes actores que somos nosotros, los recicladores de base. Los que de alguna forma, insisto, nos hemos hecho cargo de un tema que nadie se ha hecho cargo, vulnerando todos nuestros derechos humanos, sin pago alguno, sin reconocimiento ni siquiera de que es un trabajo, porque es un trabajo porque es un servicio, no se reconoce. Recién en la UTE se está poniendo puntos importantes sobre el tema de los trabajadores informales, pero en ninguna parte dice que los recicladores de base somos parte de esos trabajadores informales. Se habla de transición, pero no se habla de transición justa. Por eso para nosotros la incidencia y nuestro protagonismo en UNEA y en todos los tratados a nivel internacional que se están haciendo son fundamentales, pero es fundamental también la voz de ustedes, la voz de ustedes clave para poder realmente llegar a un, a un sistema que realmente sea, eh, que se haga sinergia real y concreta tanto con los actores ambientalistas y con los recicladores de base. Tenemos una gran tarea, tenemos un gran desafío. Nosotros, los waste pick, los recicladores, los recolectores, los cartoneros, los catadores, los pepenadores, ya lo estamos haciendo. Y lo estamos haciendo hace muchos años. Cuarta generación en Chile. Y en otros países hasta sexta generación. Hemos cumplido y estamos tomando un rol protagónico hace mucho años. Solo falta que la comunidad, la sociedad civil, se haga cargo de esto, pero de una forma concreta. No solamente con impactos comunicacionales, no solamente con grandes prensa, no solamente con el titular, sino con acciones concretas. Y nosotros estamos haciendo acciones concretas. Muchas gracias.
Gracias, Soledad. It's so important to draw the connection, the cross-generational work required to, to both address pollution and to acknowledge the work that's already been done. And as you were starting to highlight, like human rights, the basic economic and social and environmental rights of every person is implicated, but particularly those who are on the front lines. I'm wondering if, uh, Monica, you would like to maybe draw some connections here between this human rights centered approach and these global pollution issues. Like, how are they, how, how do we do the work better if we focus on human rights and this multi generational challenge that Soledad uh, highlighted? Thank you, thank you to my co-panelists for, for this uh, very useful, interesting perspectives. And uh, I mean, there are a number of global environmental agreements dealing with pollution. The one I am working for is for one pollutant, mercury, but it's a good example, uh, I would say. Um, the, the aim of the Convention on Mercury is to protect human health and environment from emissions and releases of mercury. And I don't know how much audience knows about mercury and its use. And if you do an um, internet search, you will find quite fascinating information about mercury characteristics and that it has been used since the ancient times that is still being used in everyday uh, products like lamps and batteries, and they can end up on landfill where exactly recyclers would then be exposed to mercury containing such a waste. You will also find some rather uh, worrying information on the uh, health effects of mercury uh, and, uh, and also about the so-called Minamata disease, which is a, a neurological disease caused by mercury poisoning, uh, which was first discovered in the city of Minamata in Japan in 1956. And it was caused uh, by one form of mercury that was released from industrial wastewater uh, from a chemical factory. And the convention takes uh, its name after this place in Japan. So environmental degradation due to mercury pollution affects everyone everywhere because mercury once emitted to the air will uh, be transported over long distances and will end up in waters and land far away from a regional source and contaminate the air we breathe and the food we eat, in particular fish and seafood, but also some other food stuff like rice. And elevated levels of mercury are found nowadays in Arctic species of wildlife and uh, mercury from human activities has recently been found even in the Mariana Trench, the deepest ocean trench on Earth. So the current mercury contamination prevents people on the entire globe from enjoying a right to clean, healthy and sustainable environment. But particular maybe, or the biggest human rights concern is how marginalized people or people vulnerable to impacts of mercury exposure are disproportionately affected by mercury pollution and other, other type of pollution. And more concretely, uh, pregnant women and children are especially vulnerable to impacts from mercury exposure as mercury uh, impacts nervous system uh, of fetuses and children and affect their development. Also people and communities relying on traditional foods for their nutrition such as fish and mammals are especially at risk. Such people and communities may live in remote air locations where access to variety and choice of affordable and nutritious food is limited or they may prefer some traditional food for cultural reasons, or they may be fully dependent on food they find in nature, such as indigenous people in Amazon, for example. So here their rights to food are affected. Uh, marginalized and vulnerable people are indigenous people in other communities, including uh, women and children living nearby or engaging in so-called artisanal and small scale bone mining and processing where mercury is used. Mercury is very easy to use to extract gold from ore. Uh, it amalgamates with gold and such amalgamate is then burned to separate 
gold from uh, mercury then which is then released to the air and such a burning is uh, of amalgamate is uh, often done in residential areas and poses a direct threat to health of people and just give you why i'm bringing this artisanal and small scale gold money just give you a perspective that this is a huge uh, sector of informal economy engaging some 20 million workers, including four to five million of uh, women and children in many continents around the globe. Uh, and uh, some root problems of this is that uh, indigenous people and other communities engage in this informal mining due to lack of other livelihood options to learn their living. Uh, often they are not aware of health risks and such communities need to receive support to shift to other livelihood options or to shift to other extraction methods. And countries that are parties to the Minamata Convention are obliged to support, to provide such a support. And they can do so by using the Minamata Convention financial mechanism, for example. Uh, there are also communities, including indigenous people, such as in Amazon, who are affected by mercury use in such a gold mining, but they are themselves not engaged in it. However, this activity is carried out near their homes or on their land and pollutes the uh, environment where they live. And sometimes criminal groups may also engage in artisanal small-scale gold mining that is illegal and affecting local communities even beyond pollution. And the, the, the Minamata Convention is one of the, or the youngest uh, multilateral environmental agreement uh, recognizes the, these health concerns and environmental concerns and, uh, and also how it uh, may affect future generations. And it provides means, tools and measures for countries to, to address this problem uh, and uh, to phase out mercury use in everyday life, in industrial processes, and in artisanal smoking gold mining. So I would say Minamata Convention is one of the youngest conventions, uh, quite well recognizes these linkages we are talking about and uh, could serve as a model for future treaties. Uh, one of those currently being negotiated is the, uh, the new plastic treaty. So thank you, Alex, over to you. Yeah, um, and I, I actually had a follow up with Joe, but she's reconnecting uh, for the moment. So uh, I, um, yeah, I, I think these, you know, the the Mercury Treaty for me has been really useful in understanding that that direct connection because it's very much like economics, human rights, and pollution are are tied together in very intimate ways. And I think what I've read about the Plastics Treaty, it feels like it's doing that. Um, Soledad, you were very focused on like the fact that we've accumulated an overproduction and you, you've highlighted this like economic problem that has a human rights implication. Um, I, for, for those of us in other parts of the world, uh, it, it would be useful, like how does the human rights advocacy in your context, like help your your community of recyclers uh advocate for for change what what how does like a human rights focus really help facilitate what you are doing Might be a slight delay in translation. Uh, for for Soledad, uh, my my question is, uh, how are the human rights concerns in your area work like? How how does it actually affect the the work you're doing? La verdad de las cosas es que Hay que entender que los recicladores de base somos hombres y mujeres, somos el quintil más bajo de las sociedades en cada uno de nuestros países, sobre todo latinoamericanos, centroamericanos, africanos, de la India. Eh, y, y la vulneración pasa primero que nada en la forma en que nosotros trabajamos, 
trabajamos de forma realmente esclavizante, eh, sin ninguna protección ni seguro de ningún tipo. Eh, la forma de nuestro trabajo es la relación directa con la basura, con los desechos, con los jugos percolados, con todo lo que eso significa y la contaminación que existe en cada uno de los espacios, relacionada directamente con animales muertos, con comida putrefacta. Eh, tenemos una relación directa con, con la basura, o sea, ¿qué es la basura para nosotros? Eh, y eh, lamentablemente es una mezcla de residuos, la mayoría reciclables, que se transforman en algo muy tóxico y muy nocivo para nuestra salud. La vulneración de derechos de nosotros está marcada, por un lado, en las condiciones en que trabajamos, deshumanizadas, completamente vulneradas. Segundo, en que no contamos con ninguna protección social, jamás hemos sido visibilizados ni reconocidos en nuestros propios países. Por otro lado, eh, está también la vulneración de no reconocer que es un trabajo y por ende debe ser pagado sin recibir ninguna remuneración por lo que nosotros hacemos, dependiendo siempre de la venta del material, un material que también se monopoliza y se castiga a la hora de la venta del, del producto. Entonces es todo, todo lo que ustedes se pueden imaginar de vulneración de derechos, vivimos nosotros, los white pickers, los recicladores, los recolectores, los catadores, los cartoneros, los petenadores. ¿Por qué les menciono todos estos nombres? Porque así se nos llama en distintos países del mundo. Tenemos distintos nombres, pero hacemos lo mismo. Y esa es la vulneración, o sea, no existe ningún derecho garantizado en nosotros los recolectores, en los post-speakers. No existe nada. Esos son todos los derechos nuestros vulnerados. Sobre todo, eh, eh, hablando con respecto a la, a la, a la, a la panelista anterior, eh, los derechos más vulnerados de nosotros son los derechos de salud. Muchos de nuestros compañeros y compañeras recicladores de base hoy día sufren de cáncer, sufren de enfermedades renales, tenemos enfermedades en nuestra piel, tenemos contacto directamente con la polución de plomo y más la polución de plásticos. O sea, todos, todos los derechos son vulnerados. Gracias. Thank you, Soledad. It's um, really important to acknowledge that these informal roles uh, often make it hard to articulate what protections you do have, right? Um, and so advocating and for recognition and acknowledgement of those rights, it, seem, it sounds very important. And, and the more I've learned about waste pickers, seems like the center of a lot of the advocacy. I'm I'm wondering for Joe, you know, I I'm also originally from the United States, but I now live in Uruguay, which has more of a human rights tradition, like what Soledad mentioned. I'm wondering how human rights helps you advocate for like the human rights framework, the approach um is related to kind of your advocacy to address pollution and and those kind of yeah. The, the, do you understand the question? Sorry, <laughs> a slight shift. But for me, like human rights was a surprising way to address environmental issues at first as an American. And I, I, I'm wondering how that's affected your work. Uh, I think that's a really, it's a good point to, to talk about that as Americans um, or in the United States, how often we don't see what's happening in our communities um, as human rights violation. Uh, we just think that it's part of our, our um, circumstances and it's not as bad as what's happening in other places because we don't understand or we don't think that these situations could happen in our country. Um, so having that definition of human rights and having, uh, having us really and much is really important. Uh, working in a United Nations space, whether it's through going before CERD or um, participating in the treaty talks, um, it's, it's good to hear that language constantly in my head of human rights because it reminds me just how um, international a problem it is, but also how local uh, it, it, it is as a problem. I can close my eyes in a lot of circumstances and hear about a community, an indigenous tribe, in a rainforest, 
and then close my eyes and it sounds like exactly what I'm going through in my community in Wallace. All their world away because the same companies or the same power structures, whether it's government or corporations, are colluding to bring our economy. And there's no, no attention is being paid to what those conditions present to the local community. Um, I descend, the name of our organization is the Descendants Project because it talks about, because we wanted to point to the fact that we were descendants of the enslaved Africans who were brought to this country. Um, so I'm sorry, it, it, can y'all hear me um, or see me? I'm, I'm kind of unstable. Okay, just want to make sure. Yeah, well, it, it points back to the enslaved Africans. They were kidnapped and they were brought to this country. No one cared about their conditions. No one cared about their happiness or health simply because it was going to bring money to somebody else. And what we see happening is the same violation that happened to my ancestors is continuing to happen to the descendants of the enslaved. The human rights are not being acknowledged or um, considered in the same way that communities that are not connected to the enslaved Africans are, are able to express. Um, so it's just important to highlight that just as slavery was an international um, production, an international make money, so is what's happening in Kansas Rally. There's international players. I can walk on the levee next to the Mississippi River and I'll see ships from all over the world exporting and importing dangerous chemicals. I can see industry that is owned by people in Denmark or in Russia or what have you, that's all along the river in my community of Wallace. Um, and they're all participating and violating human rights in that country, but I know at least they're violating it in, in my community in Cancer Alley. No, thank you, Joe. That it's it's so important to see uh, those connections. It's not just a matter of like developed or undeveloped worlds, global south, global north separation. It, these human rights problems transcend boundaries, and because they're environmental issues, they're global issues, right? Um, and I think this leads actually really well to the next question. You know, as, as you all heard from Euphemia, our communities are focused on creating space and events to document things, document experiences at different parts of the world. And there was a question uh, for you, Monica, too, about how mercury pollution is just lot, like not communicated to the public. There's often these, you know, people don't know that it's happening. And I'm wondering, you know, when we're creating space to document, when our communities are organizing to tell stories or write Wikipedia articles, what kind of information is most useful for you, Monica, and like disseminating knowledge about the the pollution crisis uh, at the international level? And then we'll we'll ask uh, Soledad and Joe to kind of describe that for their communities as well. Well, I would say that uh, naturally what what was important when the convention was created and continues to be important is to have a scientific information and evidence. This is also because the, the, the sources of mercury or how it affects people is not, uh, it's a dynamic and fluid situation. Uh, so it's about, as I mentioned, the sources, the, the use globally, impacts on human health, who is affected, and um, and I would say it's not only natural science, but also socio-economic science, for example, to know what's the cost of um, preventing mercury pollution vis-a-vis -vis cost of uh, cleaning up, uh, and uh, What's also important is the indigenous and traditional knowledge, uh, without which it would be difficult to ensure effective implementation of the convention. Uh, and for example, I mentioned this informal sector of artisanal small scale gold mining. This is a very complex sector and here uh, information perspective, how indigenous peoples as well as local communities are affected, how they use see the use of mercury in these activities is important. And in our recent meeting of the parties to the convention, uh, they decided to 
that each of the parties uh, who has this uh, sector will uh, engage indigenous peoples and local communities in, the, in, in addressing this issue. Uh, what's important is also public awareness. Uh, very often, or I would say most of the, or all of the global conventions uh, have provisions and obligations for parties to raise public awareness. For me, Namata Convention is most of all about the health and environmental effects of mercury and mercury compounds, because without public knowing the risk, they cannot always make right choices to protect themselves, but also then it's also gaining this critical mass and an overall knowledge to, to push for implementation of the convention. Uh, so, um, so, but it starts with the basic obligation parties have to inform the public about the risks and so on. So, but that, these are just a few examples. I think what you have mentioned also about the demonstrating experiences and knowledge in the current world are very powerful also messages and stories that can help to, to to implement the convention and all other conventions too. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, uh, Soledad, uh, back to you. When you think about your experience of activating communities to to address their human rights and to address these environmental issues, how does access to knowledge make it improve or or strengthen your efforts, both you know, communicating locally and internationally? Yo creo que para nosotros, primero que nada, lo más importante es uno visibilizar eh, a estos actores, a este sector, a esta comunidad. No existe una visibiliz visibilización clara y concreta, eh, sobre todo, <coughs> por ejemplo, en, en Nairobi, en el vertedero en Dora, eh, existen muchas familias recolectando residuos y mucha gente no sabe que existe esa gente adentro, que existen esos compañeros recolectando. Creo que esa es una muy importante eh, línea en la que se tiene que hacer, visibilizar, levantar un registro de cuántos somos los que vivimos de la basura y recolectamos estos residuos, por un lado. Segundo, eh, un informe científico, tal cual como lo dice Mónica, es clave levantar informe científico, entender el impacto que esto genera en la salud y no solamente los que vivimos de la basura, sino los que viven en el torno a la basura porque todos los rellenos y vertederos están eh, ubicados en sectores rurales, en sectores indígenas, en sectores eh, de comunidades pobres, y no en lugares de ABC1, de gente con mucho dinero o acomodada. Jamás va a haber un vertedero cerca de ellos. Por otro lado, creo que es importante hacer un estudio eh, de salud a, en nuestra comunidad, y ahí ver realmente la generación y el impacto que ha generado eh, nuestra labor por tantos años cerca de los residuos y la basura. Yo creo que se podrían sorprender mucho de eso. En Chile existe una zona que se llama Arica, donde eh, hay minas de, de cobre y también en algún minuto hubieron minas de oro. Y, y responsablemente estas transnacionales eh, vertieron eh, todo el polvo que generaban a través de, de estas minas haciendo los procesos químicos o científicos de estos productos para transformarlos en lo que ellos querían para poder hacer su comercio. Y eso terminó en un cerro. Ese cerro hoy día, como decía Mónica, produce una polución y se ha hecho un estudio de impacto, por lo menos en una gran comunidad cercana al sector. Y hoy día hasta tercera generación de hijos de esta familia tienen plomo en la sangre y que probablemente un par de años más tengan cáncer. Entonces creo que es fundamental que se haga un estudio eh, de impacto eh, en todas las comunidades que están cercanas o aledañas a este tipo de contaminación, a este tipo de contaminantes. Eh, insisto, nosotros creo que podemos, eh, eh, si se hace un estudio a nuestro, a nuestro cuerpo, a nuestra salud, se pueden impactar de la cantidad de químicos que nuestra sangre hoy día tiene, aparte de la polución por plástico. También tenemos otros tipos de químicos que pueden ser realmente importantes y gatillantes. La única forma de hacer conciencia y generar un tema claro con respecto a los derechos del humano y la vulneración de ellos es a través de los estudios y, y del impacto que esto genera. Pero también de la mano 
de investigar y sobre todo levantar un registro de quiénes son la comunidad más afectada eh, a través de estos eh, desarrollos que no tienen consecuencias más que zonas de sacrificios donde lamentablemente somos la gente más pobre, la gente más vulnerada la que, que se ve afectada con todo esto. Entonces, para nosotros es importante, creo eso, visibilizar, levantar un estudio científico, hacer estudios de salud a nuestra comunidad y el impacto también a la tierra que ha generado todo este tipo de residuos. Eso. Uh, thank you so much, Soledad, for highlighting the need for the studies and documentation. Uh, one thing I've noticed in researching this topic is that frequently there is research, but it's not widely shared. It's often missing. It's often not in a public uh, view. Oh, and we just, Joe's connection uh, just uh, broke. So I might move on to the next question, and then I'll ask her to talk about documentation as well. Um, but yeah, it's often that this research, even if there is research, it's not shared with the public. Uh, it's not in a public location. And actually this connects to something I was noticing when I was putting this panel together and outlining uh, the focus on pollution. You know, we at Wikimedia, we're building a global encyclopedia, we're building other global knowledge sources, and we have a ton of bias in the content we have on the platforms. One of these biases is that we have a lot of information about these toxic chemicals, about pollutions, about waste from a science and engineering perspective, but we often don't have that knowledge documented from a human impact perspective. perspective. A good example of this, when the East Palestine, Ohio train crash happened in February, we saw huge page view spikes uh, on Wikipedia to the event page and to information about the, the vinyl chloride chemicals that were in the crash. We had a lot of searching and information, but when you look at the chemical pages, it was very technical. It was not useful information for the public, for the breaking news community. And I'm wondering, um, and it became really clear too, that the human impact story was not being shared by the local governments, by the companies, that were responsible for for the crisis and i'm wondering you know we all enjoy a right to enjoy the benefits of science um and these breaking news events often highlight what science is missing in the public uh but how do we kind of proactively we're not just responding to the news but we actually proactively like make sure the right information is being disseminated and we're avoiding misinformation or manipulation when a crisis happens, when governments and companies maybe are trying to avoid responsibility for for something that the public should have known about. Um, so maybe we'll start with you, Monica, and then Joe, I'll, I'll give you a chance to catch up since you just reconnected. Um, yeah. Thank you, Alex. I mean, these are difficult and complex questions. Um, I would say perhaps Mina Marta Convention and Mercury is a exception that uh, we actually have a lot of documented information on impacts uh, because there were decades of pollution and some really big, big cases. So there is now a lot of science related to impacts on human health, but of course, uh, I would say uh, this is just one heavy metal and there are so many other pollutants that are concerned for human health. Uh, I would say overall what is needed more is the science communication as a profession. I mean, it exists and uh, it would be useful to have science communicators uh, or several of them in <laughs> any organization uh, dealing with science to be able to uh, provide a compelling storytelling but this that is underpinned by knowledge and it's also fit to the for the modern world um, we need also provide and that's something what Eufemia was mentioning about empowering so this information has to be provided in such a way that it empowers that give uh, positive examples hope concrete suggestions what can be done in everyday life to avoid 
exposure to chemicals, let's say. And I would think also it's important this information also contextualize. So how it does fit to the bigger picture uh, about the world we live in and how it needs to change, how the economy has to be transformed so nature and the, the services nature provides are valued, polluters pay, pay principles fully applied and they changed an economy that is no, that is no longer based on fuel, fueling endless consumptions. I would say the detail, the fact, but in the context of the bigger truth about how the change has to happen. And I would say overall also, uh, people are interested to know about uh, hazardous substances because uh, it, of course it affects uh, everyone everywhere from the domestic cleaning products, food we eat, a we breathe. So just give you an example, mercury thermometers, the, the ones I think many of you have had used in the past where you can see the silver liquid inside the thermometer. This has now been phased out thanks to the Minamata Convention and uh, from 2020, they are no longer being produced. Uh, and that's awareness that once such a thermometer breaks, I mean, that's not a good idea to play with mercury that is contained in it. So, uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a, simple thing one can do and avoid buying them in the first place, but as an example of something that uh, that is useful for everyone to, and that they know how to use that information in their everyday life. Thanks. Thanks, Monica. Yeah, I, I like in researching this topic, I feel like lead and mercury have more consensus on like, yes, the science is easy to communicate and the public is aware of it. I, I'm wondering, um, for you, Joe, like this this question of manipulation of information or making sure the right information arrives in your community and is understood. Um, how how do you think about like what what is needed? How how do we make sure that the right knowledge is there all the time, not just when like a crisis happens in your community? Well. For me, uh, for our organization, what we, we, I think there's some education that needs to happen and what and how information, what, what parts of the information are being communicated because sometimes just when we have facts and we have research, what's happening from the data that's only certain data sets are being presented or the limitations of a measurement, for example, air monitor is not um, explained because just because you're not finding a particular element or chemical in your air doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means that the instrumentation may not be able to pick it up. So that's a difference between saying, yeah, we didn't find it. And the fact that, or the fact that you don't have the instrumentation to find it. So like, it's just being able to explain all those different layers of information and also pointing to what we're seeing happen um, by companies is that there's a lot of greenwashing. Um, so they're taking particular elements or, or positions based on one, one fact or one part of a fact. They're not really going deep into that fact because when you start to drill down, you'll start to see that it's not really what it's purported to be or, or the, the business or the industry that they're trying to bring in. Um, so it helps we tell our community, is to, don't just take the surface level of the information, even for us. Even we want our information needs to be validated. That's why we use peer review research. We use really credible sources. We make sure that if we are checked and we want our community to check our information, that they are getting the pro appropriate information. Really, trust no one. You have to re you have to be the researcher and you have to find that information and you have to get that validation um, based on a certain set of standards that stays the same no matter what, no matter who's presenting it to you. That's the only way to really. I feel give accurate information, um, but also making sure the information is accessible because we have to use a lot of terms sometimes that are more complicated. Where, um, for example, like the green the the green terminal that we're fighting or the petkin companies, they can just go on. We bring jobs, and because it's a a positive thought, 
it doesn't need sometimes as much explanation or it makes people happy just on that level that, oh, wow, I get an opportunity to work or to get this job. But we know based on that information, that's just, it's not true because when we ask, okay, well, where are the jobs? What's the training for the jobs? Um, what's the like the, the amount of jobs? What's the average salary? That brings in a lot more measurables or a lot more elements to consider. It makes the, the answer though a little more complicated. So I think they get to deal in simplicity, well, we have to deal in more complicated because it's just a more complicated answer that needs to be um, given. Um, what I think would help our communities is I, something that when we go through storms after like Hurricane Ida, which was the, la the la last um, hurricane we went through in 2021, there's a mobilization that happens. So we get these vans that come, um, where there's FEMA, where there's other different agencies, and they mobilize in our communities. They have laptops and they have computers set up, but they also have the experts there on hand to help walk the community through the information, through the process. I think having information available um, more often like that about environmental justice, about human rights, whether it's a, a collaboration with Wikimedia, something that we can do together to have these resources available um, to communities would be helpful. Also, not forgetting the fact that a lot of people um, still use printed material, especially in areas like mine where you may have older um, citizens. So having some uh, through line with printed material and virtual, so you know, it makes it easier for communities like me to communicate that information um, to everybody so everyone has a fair access to it. Thank you, Joe. I, I think it's so important to focus on these different formats for access, as Euphemia highlighted, to like having it in your own language matters a lot. Having it in simple language matters a lot. Having it in like the variety of formats, both video and written matters a lot. And it's really powerful to have like disseminate in as many formats as possible. I'm wondering, Soledad, for your community, how, how do we prevent disinformation, misinformation from being the dominant story uh, for for these environmental issues that you're facing and the human rights issue. Sorry, there might have been a delay in the translation. For Soledad, uh, how, how do we make sure that disinformation or misinformation about your issues and context isn't the main thing being shared? I think that one of the points that you yourself mentioned, Alex, has to do with the form of the dialogue. I think Existe el mundo científico, los técnicos o los expertos de los que muchos hablan, que tienen que acercar mucho más el diálogo a la comunidad. A la comunidad. Eh, debe ser un diálogo claro, eh, preciso, concreto. Es la única forma de que la información que se esté entregando sea una información correcta y no se tergiverse o no se mal utilice esta información de parte de actores que están interesados en que no sepamos lo que realmente está ocurriendo, en que no sepamos realmente la verdad. Eh, se necesita empoderar y apropiar eh, lo que está ocurriendo, eh, no solamente en, en, en espacios reducidos, sino que en todos los espacios. Eh, el informe no debe ser un informe violento, no debe ser un informe como, como estamos acostumbrados a aprender la tele, ver la noticia, y lo primero que sale en la noticia son crímenes, eh, atrocidades, guerras y un montón de cosas. Tiene que ser una información eh, mucho más alentadora, tiene que ser una información también con esperanza, con, con mucha esperanza, con una oportunidad de, de realmente asumir y hacernos cargo de esta transformación o este cambio que queremos hacer. Eh, eh, la, la noticia tiene que ser una noticia muy directa, muy concisa, eh, es la única forma de que los actores que hoy día están 
tratando de desinformar a través de, 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 de sus mecanismos comunicacionales, no nos arrebaten la verdadera noticia. Pero para eso se requiere ese acercamiento con la comunidad. Se requiere eh, tener un diálogo mucho más eh, a nivel de, de la comunidad, no tan elevado. No, tú mismo lo dijiste que en el fondo, yo también he visto informes que, que, que para mí es chino mandarín. No lo entiendo, no lo logro comprender. Y necesito saber qué realmente es lo que está pasando. Por eso el diálogo tiene que ser muy cercano. Y por último, creo que educar, educar, educar. Creo que tenemos esa gran tarea de, de entregar herramientas para educar a la comunidad y darle todo el conocimiento o toda la eh, eh, claridad posible que tengamos nosotros para que ellos entiendan lo que realmente está ocurriendo y se hagan parte de esto y que la desinformación no sea la que gane eh, en este escenario tan complejo que tenemos hoy día. Sabemos que una de las herramientas más grandes que ocupa el sistema político o el sistema económico es la desinformación, las comunicaciones. A veces dicen que la comunicación es el cuarto poder. Yo pienso que es el primer poder porque es el que entra a tu casa, el que se comunica directamente contigo a través de la televisión, a través de la radio, hoy día a través de las redes sociales. Entonces, la comunicación tiene que ser muy clara, pero muy, muy cercana, con cosas muy concretas, para poder ganarle a la desinformación. Por lo menos esa es nuestra visión y esa es nuestra mirada desde acá, de donde nosotros entendemos la vulneración de los derechos que hoy día el mundo político y empresarial no quiere que la comunidad lo sepa, que la comunidad esté abierta y despierta a esto. Eh, los celulares son una herramienta de dominación, todos lo sabemos pero tenemos que ocupar esta herramienta de dominación a favor nuestro que nos permita llegar al resto de la comunidad que está conectada. Y uno de los eh, aliados más importantes en esta eh, comunicación eh, que sea real y clara y que le ganemos a la desinformación es la juventud. La juventud que se está manejando con las redes sociales de una forma realmente eh, a, con una rapidez importante y creo que ahí tenemos un, un, un instrumento muy importante. Yo lo veía en la exposición y en el video que presentaste, cómo la comunidad juvenil se hace parte de algo. Ellos son los que van a hacer que esto pueda cambiar. Por eso la comunicación tiene que ser bajo esa línea, bajo eso tenemos que adaptarnos a lo que se está moviendo. Esto se está moviendo rápido, a favor o en contra, pero tenemos que ocuparlo a favor. Y para eso se requiere también que los científicos, los técnicos, los expertos viajen, bajen su diálogo, sea mucho más claro, más concreto, más conciso. Eso. Gracias. Thank you so much for that perspective. I think simplifying and bringing things down to the local context is so important, especially when we want to think about the next generation of defenders of our human rights and activities. Um, I want to give each of my panelists an opportunity because we're approaching the end of time to just briefly, you know, is there anything you want to highlight or we didn't discuss uh, that you want to say in conclusion? Um, I'll, I'll start with Monica. Well, I would say perhaps refer to something that was discussed and what Joe said, that this is nowadays a responsibility of everyone really to seek information, to understand and build your own knowledge. And unfortunately, or fortunately, this is how it is. And I would say for anyone to lead a healthy and sustainable life, really, it's a skill to build, to know where to look for information and what kind of information to be able to distill it and find it the, the right one. So. In the past, this was just something useful to have. Nowadays, it's necessary basically to, to survive. So the, the responsibility is definitely shifted to the reader and to the person. That's how I feel. And I think that's how the nowadays world is. I would encourage everyone really to, to make use of that uh, for their own uh, benefit. Thank you so much. Thanks. And, and Joe. Yes, and thank you. Um, I think of this, um, just to use the analogy of, of a chess game, and um, when you think when you're playing chess, um, we know one thing that the chess pieces can move, but the board, those squares never change. They're always stable, but no matter what, how the chess player, 
whatever strategy he has, he has to contend with the way that the board is laid out. I think our human rights are the board um, of clean air, clean uh, water, land, no pollution. That's the board that the game of chess should be played on. Instead of being the chess pieces that we have it now, we should not have those elements in the field to play to be checkmated by money or by someone else's happiness over ours. So I think really making sure that those elements never are part of the game or instead the foundation of the game and everything else those pieces have to move around that because the, the, our human rights are immovable. But knowing where the boundaries are, the, the information can help us really strengthen those boundaries of the board, of that, that foundation, so that we know when someone is trying to invade and making sure we keep those pieces in check. So having that free flow of information, knowing how to... Um, challenge permits, knowing what permits are needed, and a plethora of all the other information that exists um, on this planet and having a resource like, um, you know, like our websites, like the internet, are very important to make sure that we keep ourselves protected and, and making sure that, um, yeah, we just know, we know the strategy that's also being used against us. So yeah, just really thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be here. Uh, that's so wonderful. I, I always think of Wikipedia as kind of the floor uh which we like launch all conversations on it's like it's the public knowledge that's out there that people can access and it's our job to raise that floor <laughs> make it make it clear where the where the the baseline is uh Soledad, do you have any closing thoughts sí solamente quiero um, decir que debemos ser actores reales de cambio Y debemos accionar este nuevo paradigma. Pero para poder accionar este nuevo paradigma, debemos visibilizar en esto en todos los rincones del mundo. Sobre todo la vulneración de los derechos humanos. Y lo que significa eso en términos de contaminación, no solamente para nosotros como seres humanos, sino también para nuestro planeta. También creo que es importante que hoy día entendamos que tenemos una gran oportunidad, una gran oportunidad para ser actores importantes en este cambio de esta historia. Pero para eso también tenemos que sentirnos protagonistas de este cambio de historia. Podemos realmente marcar la diferencia. Estamos llamados a marcar la diferencia. Solo pregúntense por qué hoy día, a esta hora, estamos reunidos acá un grupo de hombres y mujeres hablando de estos temas donde hay muchos de millones de hombres y mujeres en este minuto trabajando, moviendo el planeta, moviendo sus países. Hoy tenemos la oportunidad, pero para eso debemos reaccionar y ser parte de esta historia, pero de buena forma. Escribir. Thank you, Soledad. And I, I oh. Were you finished? Oh, bueno. Uh, gracias para uh, gracias para todo. Um, thank you all uh, for this wonderful panel. I feel so inspired. Uh, as as we we said, this campaign is about creating knowledge and information and highlighting the most marginalized, the most missing forms of knowledge around different environmental crises. And this year, our focus on pollution is to handle this just that. I realize we're a couple minutes over the end of the panel, and I want to acknowledge that. And just with a lot of love and grace, uh, I appreciate all that you have brought uh, to this panel. Um, and I hope we're doing justice and capturing your voice in that work. Um, and I hope we can continue to do that as we create documentation um, on Wikimedia projects about the knowledge gaps uh, here. Um, I'm briefly going to show everyone uh, how you too can get involved in the campaign. Uh, this panel is just the beginning of uh, the conversation. And in order to uh, participate on Wikipedia, I realize most people in this audience are existing Wikimedia contributors. And so if you're already a Wikimedia contributor, the best thing you can do is you can join us on this um, uh, meta.wikimedia.org slash wiki slash wiki for human rights. 
and click on the join the challenge page. You can write content now, you can translate content, you can document these stories now that are really impactful for, for uh, different audiences, marginalized communities, communities that they're, they're, the impact on their human rights are not being acknowledged uh, yet. Um, or uh, other environmental issues that affect all of us. You know, as Monica mentioned, there are many, many excess deaths all around the world because of the various environmental crises we're facing. This is not just something that affects marginalized communities, but it's about all of us and future generations. So documenting those stories on the Wiki for Human Rights Challenge, and if uh, you're you're newer to the movement and you want to learn more about how you can contribute, we do have community events around the world that often have newcomer trainings and uh, kind of opportunities and instructions, and you can join one of those community events. Uh, we, we have uh, this year a lot of coordinated events in Central and Eastern Europe, Africa, the Middle East, the Maghreb, uh, Latin America and the Portuguese speaking context. And so uh, if you want to join us, uh, you can go there. You can also reach out to myself or uh, Euphemia to ask questions and clarify. And again, uh, you know, I hope everyone goes off into the world feeling empowered that we can document and share information and stories to address these environmental crises. Um, I am often overwhelmed by the climate crisis and the pollution crisis and the biodiversity crisis. And I know one step, one thing I can do to address them is to work on, to contribute to Wikimedia projects, to share information that's needed with just a few more people. And so I hope you too feel empowered to do that. Um, and thank you for attending the, the session. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Gracias. Bye. Gracias.